the Hawaiian Islands have trade winds that blow from the northeast pretty much all year long. And the eastern or windward shores of the islands capture those cool winds, as well as the cooling moisture and rainfalls. Now, the western or leeward shores of the islands are typically much drier and hotter. However, that heat does not take away from their beauty. And you can see for yourself the picturesque landscape of the Waianae or leeward shores of the island of Oahu. Now, in today's lecture, we're interested in temperature changes, and we're focusing on one problem, raising the temperature of water from a very low temperature up to a very warm temperature. And it has to pass through a couple of phase changes. In our previous lecture, we discussed the intermolecular forces that are responsible for holding the solid and liquid phases together. Well, in today's lecture, we're going to take a look at the amount of energy that it does cost to actually break those interactions. In other words, the energy cost for melting or for boiling a substance. Let's take a look. You recall that solids are held together through locking intermolecular forces. Those particles are locked together. Now, if you want to convert a solid to a liquid, first of all, you're going to have to raise the temperature of that solid up to the melting temperature. Now, that's going to cost some energy as well, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. But once you get the temperature of the solid up to the melting temperature, to actually melt it requires those intermolecular interactions to be broken so that the particles can flow past one another. And that requires an extra amount of energy to actually break those interactions. Now similarly, once you have your liquid and you want to, say, convert it to a gas, you're going to have to warm up your liquid up to the boiling temperature. That will cost you some energy. And when it's at the boiling temperature and those liquid particles have that sufficient amount of molecular motion, to actually boil it and break those interactions completely will also cost an extra amount of energy. So melting and boiling a substance does actually cost energy. So how much energy does it cost? Well, that's given by the heats of fusion and vaporization. The heat of fusion is the energy cost to melt a solid when it's at the melting temperature. And the heat of vaporization is the energy cost to vaporize a liquid when it's at the boiling temperature. The uh, heat of fusion for water is 6.02 kilojoules per mole. So if you want to melt one mole of water, it's going to cost 6.02 kilojoules. And to melt two moles of water would cost twice that much, kilojoules per mole. Now, the heat of vaporization is a lot larger than the heat of fusion. 40.7 kilojoules per mole versus 6.02. Now that should make some sense. After all, if you take a look at the liquid, particles are close together. And to boil a liquid, you're separating those particles completely. And that's going to cost quite a bit more energy to completely separate the particles than just to melt them. So if you want to vaporize one mole of water, at the boiling temperature, it'll cost 40.7 kilojoules. And if you have two moles to vaporize, it'll cost twice that much. So however many moles you have, you're going to have to multiply this number times that many moles. So the formula is the number of moles times the heat of vaporization. And a similar formula for calculating the amount of heat to melt something. It would be the number of moles times the heat of fusion. Now we can compare water's heats of fusion and vaporization with those of acetone. And acetones are quite a bit less than water. It only costs 5.69 kilojoules per mole to melt acetone and only 29.1 to boil acetone.
Well, if you take the lo a look at the structure of acetone, you can see why. Here's the structure of acetone, and we see that although it does have a permanent dipole, it does not hydrogen bond like water does. The interactions in acetone are not as strong as they are in water, so it shouldn't cost as much energy to melt and boil acetone. Now, a certain note does need to be made here that when you do melt or boil a substance, the temperature of that substance remains constant. So as a substance melts or as it boils, it doesn't change temperature. For instance, if you have a, a beaker of water and you want to boil that beaker of water, well, of course you would have to raise its temperature up to the boiling temperature. Now, when water is at the boiling temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, as it boils, the temperature of the liquid water stays at 100 degrees Celsius until all the water has boiled off. Phase changes take place at a roughly constant temperature. Now, in our previous semester of general chemistry, general chemistry one, we did discuss the energy cost to change the temperature of a substance. We did not go through energy costs for changing the phase like we are here, but we did discuss the energy cost to change the temperature of a certain phase of a substance. And when you raise the temperature of a substance, it does cost energy. How much? Well, that's given by the specific heat capacity. And here are the specific heat capacities for several substances. For solid gold, it costs 0.128 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So the units are a little bit different here. It's joules per gram per degree Celsius. So if you have, say, one gram of gold and you want to change its temperature from 14 degrees Celsius up to 15 degrees Celsius, then it's going to cost you 0.128 joules. If you have two grams of gold and you want to change its temperature from 14 degrees Celsius to 15, then it'll cost twice that much. Now similarly, if you want to change its temperature from 14 degrees Celsius up to 16 degrees Celsius, that's changing its temperature by two degrees. It'll also cost twice that much. So the total amount of heat that it costs will be equal to the specific heat times the mass times the change in temperature that you want to raise it. And we can see that the units work out here, the units of the heat capacity when multiplied by units of mass as well as units of degrees Celsius that you change it by we'll end up with units of joules, which is the same as heat. Now we can compare the specific heat of gold with other substances. Ethanol, liquid ethanol, costs 2.42 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And that specific heat is kind of similar to solid and gaseous water, 2.09 and 2.01. However, liquid water has a much larger specific heat, 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. It costs a lot of energy to raise the temperature of liquid water. Now, here in Hawaii, we can see that firsthand. On the neighboring Big Island, there's an active volcano that spews forth lava into the ocean all year round and this lava is extremely hot. However, it doesn't boil all the water all around it because it takes a lot of energy to boil that water. So although right where the lava is going into the ocean, the water is pretty hot, but a little bit farther out, it's cool again because it takes a lot of energy to really raise the temperature of water. Here's an example of calculating the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a substance that also passes through a couple of phase changes. The question asks how much heat is required 
to warm 10.0 grams of water from negative 25 degrees Celsius to 125 degrees Celsius. Now at negative 25 degrees Celsius, that's solid water below the freezing temperature. And 125 degrees Celsius is water in the gas phase above the boiling temperature. So to go from cold ice up to hot gas, several things need to be done. First of all, the, the cold ice needs to be warmed up to the melting temperature. That will cost energy. Then the ice needs to be melted. That will cost more energy. Then what is now liquid needs to be warmed up from the melting temperature all the way up to the boiling temperature. That will cost some more energy. And then it will cost more energy to actually boil the water. And then finally, once the water has been boiled to raise the temperature up to the final value of 125, will cost even more energy. So there ends up being five different stages for this process. So the total amount of energy is equal to Q1 for warming the solid, plus Q2 for melting, plus Q3 for warming the liquid, plus Q4 for boiling, and then plus Q5 for warming the gas. You add these energies together and you get the total energy. Now we can take a look at this on a graph and here is a plot of temperature versus the amount of heat added. Now as you add heat to the substance, the temperature of course increases and we can see that as we add heat the temperature ends up increasing up to the final value of 125. However, at the beginning you start off with the solid. Now when you add heat to the solid, it warms up. But once it gets up to the melting temperature of zero degrees Celsius, any additional heat that's added will go towards melting it. The temperature does not change during melting or boiling. So the temperature remains constant as the substance is melted. Now once it's all been melted, the additional heat will go to warming up the liquid from zero degrees up to 100. And so that will take quite a bit of heat. You remember the specific heat capacity of liquid water is pretty high, 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So water takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature of it. And that's why the slope of the water line is a little bit less than the slope of the solid line or the gas line because it takes more energy to raise the temperature of water. Now once you do add that much energy to warm up the liquid water from zero to a hundred, it's ready to boil and any additional energy will go towards boiling it. And after it's been boiled, then it is now a gas and any additional energy goes to warming up the gas. Now we saw in our previous slide that when a substance is warmed, the expression for calculating the energy is the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature. The specific heat needs to be the specific heat of either the solid, the liquid, or the gas, whatever you're calculating at the time. And to change the phase, whether it's melting or boiling, it's the number of moles times the heat of fusion or the heat of vaporization. So let's take a look at the, the five calculations, Q1 up to Q5. Q1 for warming up a solid will be the mass, 10 grams, times the specific heat of the solid, 2.09 joules per gram per degree Celsius times the change in temperature, final minus initial. Now when you calculate mass times specific heat times change in temperature, 
the units end up giving you units of joules. Let's go ahead and convert that to kilojoules so that we can add it to the other energy terms and they'll all be in kilojoules when we add them. So we add one more factor here to convert it to kilojoules. One kilojoule divided by a thousand joules. And when you calculate this, you end up with 0.5225 kilojoules. This is a three sig fig number because we started with three sig figs. So the two is underlined. However, we'll go ahead and keep that extra digit after the two because we're going to use this number again when we add the energies. Now the second stage is melting. And when you melt a substance, it's the number of moles times the heat of fusion. So we need to convert our 10 grams to moles. So we take our 10 grams, we multiply it by one mole divided by 18.02 grams. This is the number of moles. You take your moles and you multiply it by the heat of fusion, 6.02 kilojoules per mole. All of that gives you 3.3407 kilojoules, another three sig fig number. The third stage is warming up what is now liquid water. 10 grams times the specific heat of water, which is 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius, times the change in temperature. And here the final temperature is 100 and the initial temperature is zero. Water goes from zero all the way up to a final temperature of 100. And then multiply it by the same conversion factor to convert it to kilojoules. And this one gives you 4.180 kilojoules. The fourth stage is boiling, and that will be the number of moles times the heat of vaporization. So the number of moles was calculated similarly as it was up in the second stage. And you multiply that this time by the heat of vaporization, which you recall is a lot larger than the heat of fusion. And this gives you 22.586 kilojoules. This is also a three sig fig number, so that five is underlined. And the last stage is warming up what is now the gas. Mass times the specific heat of the gas times the change in temperature. And here the final temperature is 125 and the initial temperature is 100. Converting it to kilojoules, you end up with 0 0.5025 kilojoules. Now notice that in all of these five calculated energies, the last significant figure was underlined. So when you add these together, you use the addition and subtraction rule for significant figures. And it turns out that the answer is limited to the tenth position. So the answer ends up being 31.1 kilojoules. So it's quite a bit of energy to raise the temperature from cold ice all the way up to hot gas. In our next lecture, which should also be a shorter lecture, we'll take a closer look at phase changes and be interested specifically in the process of vaporization. So I hope you join me for that.